kicked off Advent on Sunday, but now we've got our midweek services uh, to continue preparing uh, for Jesus' return, his second coming, as we remember his first coming. So um, <clears throat> thanks, worship team, for being here this evening and leading us in worship and singing together. Uh, our our uh, theme this um, Advent will be Savior of the Nations, as we look at people who were not originally part of the covenant that God made to Abraham. You remember in the Old Testament, Abraham, how God made a covenant with him and said that he would bless him and have him be uh, as, as fruitful as, as the stars are in the sky or the sands are on the Lake Lahamadu. No, I'm <laughs> just kidding. Um, but as, as the sand is on the, on the ocean. Uh, so we'll look at people who were not originally part of that covenant that God actually brings into the covenant to show that he's the savior of the nation. So uh, our theme hymn for this Advent will be Savior of the Nations Come. So let us join together in singing uh, that hymn together. and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let, Let us, us rejoice, rejoice and, and be glad in it. it. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. Our God shall come. He, he does, does not keep silence. silence. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Shower, O heavens, from above, and let the skies rain down righteousness. Let the earth open, that salvation may sprout forth. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. I confess to God Almighty before the whole company of heaven and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have sinned in thought word and deed by my fault by my own fault by my own most grievous fault wherefore i pray god almighty to have mercy on me forgive me all my sins and bring me to everlasting life amen the almighty, almighty and merciful lord grant you pardon forgiveness and remission of all your sins amen I confess to God Almighty, before the whole company of heaven, and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have sinned in thought, word, and deed, by my fault, by my own fault, by my own most grievous fault. Wherefore, I pray to God Almighty to have mercy on me, forgive me all my sins, and bring me to everlasting life. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant you pardon, 
forgiveness, and remission of all your sins. Amen. You may be seated as we have our first reading, our first and only uh, reading uh, from two sections of Joshua where we hear about uh, the first person who will hear that God brought into uh, the covenant who was outside of it, Rahab. Joshua chapter 2 verses 8 through 14 and chapter 6, 23 through 25. Before the spies laid down for the night, Rahab went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given this land to you and that a great fear of you has fallen on us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard now the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to Sion and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted and everyone's courage failed because of you, for the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and mother my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and that you will save us from death. Our lives for your lives, the men assured her. If you don't tell what we are doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us the land. So the young men who had done the spying went in and brought out Rahab, her father and mother and brothers, and all who belonged to her. They brought her brought out her entire family and put them in, in a place outside the camp of Israel. Then they burned the whole city and everything in it, but they put, a sil- but put the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron into the treasury of the Lord's house. But Joshua spared Rahab, the prostitute, with her family and all who belonged to her because she hid the men Joshua had sent as spies to Jericho. And she lives among the Israelites to this day. This is the word of the Lord. We continue by singing uh, hymn 359, Lo, how a rose air blooming.
grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, this, this evening, not this morning, <laughs> this evening we continue in Advent as it started on Sunday. Advent is a time of season in which we prepare. You can see that stuff in the sanctuary. I, I'll, I'll get it later. Don't worry about it. <laughs> You can see that things in the sanctuary have changed a little bit. Decorations have gone up. The, the, the colors are different. But it's not just here at church, right? Probably all of you, now that Thanksgiving is over, it seems appropriate now to uh, put up Christmas decorations, right? Yeah. Um, some people see Christmas as starting in, th- in, in November, and then Thanksgiving is a day, and Christmas lasts forever. <laughs> But this time of Advent, things start to change a little bit. We make holiday plans with friends and family. And here in the church, we prepare for Jesus' second coming by focusing on his first coming. Now for this season, it might surprise you that we're starting out our Advent midweek series, Savior of the Nations, and focusing in on the Old Testament, especially with the book of Joshua, where we hear about the narrative of Rahab, the prostitute? Kind of odd, don't you think? I mean, if I were to say to you, hey, we're, we're thinking about doing this Advent series, uh, and, and I want your opinion. Uh, I want to pick someone from the Old Testament. Who might you pick for us to start in the Old Testament talking about. You might say, oh, Moses would be good. People that, someone that people know, right? Or, or maybe Noah or Abraham, right? We all know that song, Father Abraham had many sons, had many sons, had father. Maybe you don't know it. Some people know it. <laughs> But you know about Abraham, right? He, he's, he's like the man in the Old Testament, right? I mean, compared to Rahab, it's, it's, it's odd that we would start with Rahab instead of Abraham. God promised that through Abraham would come an entire nation of people. And not just that an entire nation would come from him, but that all nations would be blessed through him. Abraham was called out of paganism, out of unbelief from following what his fathers had taught him and they didn't believe in God to all of a sudden following God, giving up the way of his life, his inheritance, all of his goods, and traveling with his family on a promise from a God that he just began a relationship with. Abraham is one of the most significant figures in Judaism. But when Matthew starts his gospel, he begins the genealogy. If you go and open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 1, you'll find that the genealogy of Jesus starts with Abraham. So it makes sense to talk in Advent in light of Jesus' coming about Abraham rather than Rahab. And if you are following a little bit along in the genealogy of of Matthew, you can go a little bit further down. And if you're not willing to just kind of glance over his genealogy because it seems repetitive and slightly a little boring (laughs) because it's all people you don't always really know, you'll find a name. You'll find a name in that genealogy of Jesus, of Rahab, the woman that we read about from Joshua, chapters 2 and 6. And you think about Rahab and the title that's assigned to her in Joshua chapter 6, verse 25. Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute. (laughs) If you were to be known by anything, you might want to keep that 
out of your family history, wouldn't you? And if you start looking in the rest of the genealogy in Matthew, you'll find people that have all sorts of flaws. I mean, you look at Jacob. He was a deceiver, stole the inheritance from his brother. Judah, (laughs) Judah wasn't even the firstborn, and he gets mentioned. So it shouldn't surprise you that in this list is Rahab, mentioned as a mother in the line of, of Jesus. In fact, she's one of only, I think it's three women mentioned in the genealogy, which is weird for genealogies back then. Rahab is highlighted in the book of Joshua for what she did for the nation of of Israel. Here's the picture. Joshua is planning to go and and siege Jericho. You remember what happened with Jericho? All the people of God, all the Israelites marched around for seven days yelling or were quiet for a while, playing their horns. And on the seventh day, they blasted their horns, they yelled, and all of a sudden the walls came tumbling down, right? Joshua fit the battle of Jericho, Jericho. Yeah, yeah brought the walls tumbling down. But the only reason they were able to do that is because of what Rahab did that night when spies were sent into Jericho to figure out what was going on in the city and how they could attack it. Rahab brought them into her house that night, which was located in the city walls. She housed them there, and then when all of a sudden court city officials found out that these foreigners, these Israelites, were staying inside their walls, they rushed to Rahab's house, and they questioned her. And Rahab, did you hear about it? The Israelites said to her that if you do not tell them what we are doing, we will treat you kindly. And she didn't tell them. She essentially said, oh, they just got out of town, but if you hurry fast, you'll be able to catch them on the way out. They didn't catch those spies. Rahab compared to Abraham, they seem like two extremely different people. And I can't think of two people in Jesus's family tree who are more different than Rahab and Abraham. Abraham, a patriarch. Rahab, a prostitute. Abraham, the father of many nations. Who knows how many children Rahab was the mother of? Abraham, a man who came from great wealth and providence. Rahab, outside the camp, almost outside of the city itself. She was so poor that the only place she could have a home was on the outside of the walls, was inside, was on the outside of the walls. And when there's a battle, what place do you think gets attacked first when a city is sieged? Abraham, the first Jew, and Rahab, not even close. She's a Gentile. So why does Matthew include them in the same genealogy? After all, it's embarrassing enough that such a person would be not only delivered by God, but would be the mother of those who would lead to Jesus, who delivers us all. We might not think to include details like that if we were asked to write a gospel, right? If you were giving an account of Jesus' life, you might not think to include someone who's so shameful with a past and a history like that. In fact, we would want certain details omitted or changed. And as you look at the history of your own life, If you had to tell your life story to someone else, what might you write? Maybe let's make it a little little less personal. Let's think about the United States. If you were telling a quick history, kind of an overall history, major points of our history, would you share just only the good parts? Hmm. 
Or would you mention things like America's history with slavery? Would you mention things that led to slavery? Would you mention things that led up to one of the bloodiest wars that we've ever had? And then even after that war was fought, discrimination was still legal for years. Things put in place to not allow people to buy homes, to not allow them to get education, to not allow them to be seen with other people. Would you omit those details? It's part of our story, and yet there's lots of things in our story, just even in our nation, that we would much rather just not pay any attention to, right? And then you even start to think about your own life. Are there chapters in our life that would much rather not be told? Imagine the worst moment that has happened to you in your life, and now imagine that on these walls, as you look around, that those things would start to be written up there. (laughs) Would you quickly run over with a magic eraser and try and cover it up and get it down off the wall as quick as possible so that no one could see? You would want to gloss over those moments. Every one of us in this room, as we said in our confession, we said the same confession, I to you and you to me, we all said that we have fallen short of the glory of God. We haven't done His will. In fact, we've tried to hide those things from him who, who created our very story with his very breath as he gave us our own lives. And we try and hide things from him. And it creates div- division among us. Without even meaning it, we allowed the division of the world to influence us. We divide up our lives from others We make sure that they don't know about these pieces and only know about these pieces. We make sure that certain people only know certain things about us. We make sure that certain people only know other certain people. We develop prejudices against those who aren't in our own groups, who don't fit our story, who don't fit our picture of the status that they need to live up to. It can happen in all sorts of different ways. They might not have the same level of education. They might not have as nice of boat as we do. They might not drive as nice of car as we do. They might not have a home on the right side of town. They might be one of those people that sends their kid to that school. They might not have the right last name like we do. There are lots of ways where we are tempted to look down on those who have a lower status than us, and it creates division. It creates walls with people gathered in the center who seem to be the safest, and those who are on the outskirts are the most vulnerable, and, well, someone's got to go first, so it might as well be them. These divisions we create do seem significant. And the divisions that we experience in the world today, they were also felt in the time of Jesus. Rahab experienced them. Lots of people in Jesus' ministry experience them. You think about the, the Samaritan woman who Jesus met at the well who only went in the daytime to fetch water and couldn't go with her friends for way of her life. Think about those who Jesus ministered to who had leprosy, who had to cry out, unclean, unclean. Think about the tax collectors and the prostitutes. But the good news is this. 
that God's grace works through all kinds of people. God's grace so worked in the life of Rahab that she feared God more than she feared the very king of Jericho who could have changed her life and moved her inside the walls if she had just given up those spies. But she makes this great confession of faith, not by her own power, but because she's heard the good news about God. And the fear that he brings has melted her own heart, and she sees that there's nothing else that she can do but to confess that he is Lord, the God, that God is God in the heavens above and on the earth below. And she sees that as good news for herself. If we were to judge by outward appearances, we would see many differences between Rahab and Abraham. But in God's eyes, he sees no division. He sees no distinction. For as the rest of Scripture goes on to say that we are all one in Christ Jesus. There is neither male nor female, Greek nor Jew, Gentile or Jew. There is neither slave nor free. For we are all one in Christ Jesus. Rahab believed God and so she hid away the spies. And when that battle began, Rahab and her family were all shown mercy. You may not expect God to use people like Rahab in the story of salvation, and yet he does. He specializes in those kinds of surprises. He takes people that we would see and divide them away out of the way of God's grace and say, "Ah, they don't really fit the bill. And he uses them. I mean, that happened in 1 Corinthians when St. Paul had met them and he started speaking to them and he said, Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. In other words, God's grace, his gospel, his truth, his love, his mercy is for the poor, the destitute, the downtrodden, those who have nothing to offer God, and those who don't fit the bill because they know that they have sin, and if they were to stand before God, they would melt away like Rahab did. But at least she admits it, and she sees her need for that Savior. Now, that doesn't mean... That doesn't mean that those who are rich, who aren't downtrodden, who do seem to fit the bill, are outside of God's grace. Because look, St. Paul says, not many of you were this way. So perhaps there were some that were rich. But the point is that God's routine is always to create faith in those who seem worse off by our standards by our metrics, by our measurements, God works faith in them. St. Paul writes this again, when he says, God chose the foolish, the weak, the lowly, the despised, so that no one may boast before him. Not a single one of us is able to stand before God or other people and say, I have this salvation because of something that I did. Rather, it's because of God that you and I are in Christ Jesus. It's because of his righteousness, his holiness, and his redemption. And so we should boast in the Lord for someone like Rahab. We should boast in the Lord for each other. That even though we come from different places, different walks of life, He loves us all. And he loves us without distinction or division. There was a a historian of the church that uh, recorded a conversation between King Edward VII and Wilson Carlyle, who was an evangelist. And on this particular day, uh, King Edward VII was alien, so he was laying in bed, and you would imagine if you heard news as a city-goer, 
is that the king was sick, you might start to wonder what was going to happen in the future. And so the king struck up a conversation with Carlisle, and he said, Carlisle, what are you going to tell my men? And without waiting for Carlisle's reply, the king answered his own question, saying, Carlisle, tell them this. The kings and tramps need the same Savior. He goes on to say, whatever distinctions, whatever divisions we create in this life, we are all equal before God. It does not matter if you're a king or a tramp, a patriarch, a prostitute, rich or poor, who you are or where you are from, for in Christ, the distinctions disappear. For Christ comes to cover up our sin. He comes to come and clean the walls of our sin and erase it from our lives. He covers it with his blood on the cross that he pours out for the entire world, but sometimes the world wants to clean away that blood and still look at their sin, to point at other people's sin. Sometimes we want to point at other people's sins say, see, it's still there. But Christ, not in his eyes. For this Savior came into the world for people like you and I and even people like Rahab, who is just like you and I. A sinner in need of God's grace and his mercy. In Christ, those distinctions disappear. And the king was right for what he said because before the throne of God on the last day, Christ will make one distinction. He will not ask where you are from or who you are, but simply whose you are. And our response is we are yours. We've always been yours. In holy baptism, I'm a child of God not a child of Abraham. I'm a child of God. For Abraham, by faith, it was credited to him as righteousness, and he believed God. You have the very forgiveness of sins that Abraham had, which is the same forgiveness of sins that Rahab had, which is the same forgiveness of sins that your neighbor has, which is the same forgiveness of sins that your spouse, your sister, your brother all have from God. But some people don't always know about that forgiveness. Some people don't know that we have this gracious God before us who would be willing to welcome people like Rahab, who we would say are, should be far off. So what are we to do about it? Well, there's many things that we could do, but this week as God's children... I want to encourage you to take some time to think about just one person. Maybe think about one person that you're planning on giving gifts to this year. And write that person down. Remember that God works in people that we may not expect to work in. And ask yourself, how could you share the good news with them? And when you're having conversations with that person, if you start to hear them maybe hint at or even explicitly say something along the lines that they think that God's not for them, that he's far off and distant, that he could never love a person like me. Well, tonight you've met a savior of the nations who knew a person like that. He knew Rahab. That person may not have a lifestyle like Rahab whatsoever, but as we've seen tonight, divisions come in all sorts of different ways that seek to separate us from our God, but we have a Savior of the nations who's willing to climb in the walls, tear them down, and show that he loves you and me and Rahab. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all our human understanding, keep and guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.
Uh, please stand as you are able as we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed, which Christians have been saying for over 1,700 years. Together we confess, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated as we uh, sing our offertory hymn together and the offering is brought forward. peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the gift of divine peace and of pardon with all our heart and with all our mind, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the Holy Christian Church, here and scattered throughout the world, and for the proclamation of the gospel and the calling of all to faith, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this nation, for our cities and communities, and for the common welfare of us all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For seasonable weather and for the fruitfulness of the earth, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who labor, for those whose work is difficult or dangerous, and for all who travel, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all those in need, for the hungry and homeless, for the widowed and orphaned, and for all those in prison, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the sick and dying, and for all those who care for them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Finally, for these and for all our needs of body and soul, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. Christ, Christ, have mercy. mercy. Lord, Lord, have, have mercy. mercy. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name. name. Thy kingdom come, thy, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give, Give us this day our daily bread, bread, and forgive, and forgive us, us our trespasses, trespasses, as we forgive those, those who trespass, trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. 
Let us bless the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve us. Amen. You may be seated as we sing our closing hymn. Worshiping together as God's family. It's good to be together. Hopefully the, the, you enjoyed the, the food that was served. Thank you for all who brought food. Uh, it was, I, I enjoyed it. It was really good. So um, I hope you enjoyed it as well. God's peace and God's blessings to you as you see uh, God working in the lives of those around you and you can go and help and, and show them that God uh, breaks down those divisions and brings us uh, Christmas joy and Christmas peace in the midst of our lives. Uh, that are broken, and yet he remakes them in Christ. Uh, so God's peace be to you. Just one announcement. Um, on December 21st, that's a, another Wednesday, that would be the fourth Wednesday in Advent, uh, we are going to forego that service and not have that service, so we'll just have two more midweek services, okay? So just wanted to make that announcement so that uh, in talking with the elders, we'll just have, um, what is today, the 30th? So... Um, the 7th and the 14th. Thank you, math. <laughs> so, thank you. Um, so, just two more weeks of that. So, uh, go in peace and serve the Lord, and have a great evening. <laughs>